so this is going to be the first video in a series which I'll be making on the basics of landscape photography. So in this series I'll be covering everything from the equipment that you can buy for landscape photography, how to compose your shots, um, what makes a good composition in landscapes. Um, also we'll be covering post-processing, editing your photos, how to use programs such as Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Lightroom, um, and really just all of these basics of, of how to do landscape photography. Now, if you've been doing landscape photography for a little while, a lot of this stuff is going to be very familiar to you. Um, but really, I'm aiming this at people who are just starting out, or maybe you've just bought your first DSLR and you want to do some landscape photography and you're not sure what the best ways to go about doing it are. Or maybe you're thinking about buying your first DSLR and you know you want to know, you know, what to look out for and what what to, sort of equipment you should be investing in for landscape photography. Um, so we'll dive straight in. In this first video, we're going to be talking specifically about equipment for landscape photography. And the first thing you're going to want to buy is a camera. Now, um, there are many options when buying cameras, but DSLRs are the way to go when you're first starting out. Um, you can pick up uh, an entry-level DSLR now for around maybe £300. The first one we bought was the Canon 1300D, um, which was, I think, £300. A lot of them come with kit lenses, um, so, um, so about 18 to 35 mils, that sort of, so 18 to 55 mils, I think it is. Um, those lenses will cover you for the basics of landscape photography great way just to get started if, 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 if you're new to photography. Um, the other thing to consider when buying your first camera is which make to go for and it's entirely down to your own preferences. So go down to the camera shop, try them out, pick up a Canon, pick up a Sony, pick up a Nikon. Um, to be honest, the photos are just as good from all of the different makes. It doesn't make any difference which one you go for in terms of a photograph. So just choose for one which feels most comfortable to you. When we chose Canon, the only reason we chose Canon was we just liked the plastic that they were made out of better than the, the Nikons at the time. That's as simple as that. And the lenses is ca from Canon as well. By the way, I'm not sponsored by any of the companies that I mentioned in this video. There's no sponsorship going on here at all. So, uh, yeah. Canon is what I use, but Nikon, just as good. Fuji, just as good. Sony, great. It doesn't matter. Uh, choose for one that you like the best. Um, when choosing a camera after the make, one of the next things to consider is what sort of sensor do you want to get? Now, the two options tend to be APS-C, and most of the cameras which cost less than a thousand pounds new will be an APS-C camera. Um, those sensors are slightly smaller than say a full frame sensor, but they're still perfectly adequate for most, lands most landscape photography situations when you're first starting out. So don't feel that you have to go for a full frame camera. An APS-C sensor is absolutely fine most of the time. One thing to bear in mind though is that by using an APS-C cropped sensor camera, um, if you're using lenses which are designed for full frame cameras, um, you will basically have to multiply your focal length by, I think it's 1.6. So um, bear that in mind if you're using, particularly if you're doing, using wide angle lenses, which you will be for a lot of landscape photography. If you did want to go full frame, but you can't quite afford to spend thousands of pounds on the camera, and let's face it, it's a huge, <laughs> cameras are expensive things. Uh, what you can do is buy secondhand, and that's exactly um, what we did when we bought um, our first full frame camera, this one here, this is for 5D Mark II. Absolutely fantastic camera. I picked this up um, on eBay for about 500 pounds, um, and by using, by getting a 5D, you have a full sensor, uh, a full frame sensor, um, in the camera, which is fantastic for landscape photography. Um, and you also have weather sealing in this camera as well, which is great. So a lot of the time, if I'm hiking up a mountain, um, in the British Isles particularly, the weather's normally wet. So it's nice to know that the camera can be used in the rain. I don't have to worry about it. Um, these cameras come with a sort of rubber gasket where the lens joins the, the, the body, um, that just make them you know, you wouldn't want to drop them in the lake or certainly wouldn't want to drop them in the sea, but I'm quite happy using this in the rain. I don't have to worry about it. So it's worth buying secondhand. Um, if you can bring yourself, you know, if you're, if you're happy to buy secondhand, it can be a really good way of getting a, a higher quality, uh, higher quality equipment at a, at a cheaper price. 
The next thing you're going to want is a lens. Now, as I say, many um, cameras will come with a kit lens, um, but the joy of using a DSLR is you can you can change lenses, you can buy build up a collection of different lenses. So you can go for um, something like this. This is um, my main lens at the moment. This is a Canon, Canon 24 to 105 mm L lens. It's part of their L series of lenses. So again, it's weather sealed like the professional bodies. I can use it in the rain. I don't need to worry about it. The image quality of this lens is fantastic, um, especially given the wide zoom range that this lens has. So it goes from 24 mils, which is a wide angle, all the way up to 105 millimeters. So you can use it as a sort of short telephoto lens as well. It is really good. One thing I would say is that if you're not going to be using the longer sort of 105 mil focal lengths, it might be worth considering something like um, a 24 to 70 um, lens, or you could opt for a prime lens, that's one which doesn't zoom. Um, and basically those lenses will have a, have a, have a better quality to them, um, a better image quality, they'll be slightly sharper. Um, but for me, when I was, I was first you know, starting out with 24 to 105, flexibility wise this is actually the kit l lens which comes um, with many of the sort of 5d 6d kits that you can buy um, it's a really fantastic lens and the quality is superb moving on from wide angle lenses you might want to consider getting a telephoto lens um, something like this this is um, a 70 to 300 mil lens this isn't from the l series of lens so it doesn't have weatherproofing um, but it's really good, you know, you, you can also go for, say, a 70 to 200 mil is a very popular landscape lens. Many people might think initially that, oh, landscapes, you'll be wanting to use wide angle lenses. And yes, most of the time I do use a wide angle lens. But certainly if I'm in the mountains and I'm taking, you know, close up photos of mountains far off in the distance, something like a, a, a 200 mil focal length is really good for just getting in close up on, on those mountain scenes. Um, we used this one quite a bit when we went to the Alps recently. Fantastic lens actually for the price, I think it was about 350 pounds or so, something like that, new. Um, yes, it's not weather sealed, but actually the quality of the images from this lens are, are pretty good um, if you're on a budget. Otherwise, if, you, if, you, if you're going for something a bit more expensive, you can go for, again, L-series lenses. This is actually the 100 to 400 mil lens. Um, fantastic lens, but normally I tend to use this more for wildlife photography. It's quite heavy to be putting in my rucksack if I'm going camping or going hiking. Um, but maybe if both me and my wife are out, if both Hannah and I are out um, together, we might take this with us as well. Um, but certainly for, for wildlife, superb but something like a 200 mil focal length um, is probably a better option for landscapes now once you've bought your camera and your lens the next most important piece of equipment which is i would say absolutely essential for landscape photography is a tripod um, now when it comes to buying a tripod you can either go for an aluminium one or if you can afford it, it might be worth going, considering getting a carbon fiber tripod like this. This is made by Ben Rowe. It's the combination COM28C. I don't think they make it anymore. Um, but carbon fibers, uh, carbon fiber tripods are great for landscape photography. If we're, if we're hiking long distances, which we usually are, um, or going camping, um, having the lightness of a carbon fiber tri tripod is a real benefit but they do tend to be quite expensive. So if you can only afford a aluminium one, and these days you can pick up aluminium tripods fairly inexpensively, they're gonna do, for most of the time, just as good a job. So yep, by all means go for an aluminium one if you can't afford a carbon fiber one, but if you can afford a carbon fiber one, it might be worth considering just for the saving that you make in terms of weight. Now, when choosing tripods, you have a couple of options for the type of head that you have on the tripod, and really that's down to personal preference. Some people like the flexibility of having a ball head. Other people prefer a three-way system. We've opted for a three-way system on our tripod. Um, I'd quite like to get a ball as well um, at some stage, but yeah, personal preference. They're all as good as each other. Um, for landscapes, you know, it's, it's three-way or ball 
of the, of the main ones. So now we've got our camera, we've got our lens, we've got our tripod. The next thing to think about is filters. Now, I use the Koken P system filter. Again, I'm not sponsored by any of these companies, so you know, please don't think that I'm advocating these products because I'm sponsored by them. Um, I went for Koken because you can basically buy a full set of these. I bought these on eBay. They're perfectly good condition. Um, and I can't remember how much I spent on these now. It wasn't too much. Um, but basically, they're pretty good quality filters, but they don't cost as much as, say, Lee filters. Um, so when you're first getting started out, if you've never used filters before, I'd recommend trying something like Koken um, just to get you going because they do a perfectly good job. I do find that at wider angles I get vignetting, so I would like to upgrade soon if I can to, um, if Hannah will let me, I'd like to upgrade to the Lee um, system. But they are very expensive, so you know, we're talking hundreds of pounds for the Lee filters. Um, but it is something which I will be upgrading to at some stage. But when you're first starting out, uh, something like the Kokins, um, perfectly fine. Like I said, this is a Koken P series of filters. I'll provide links below to all of the different filters, but um, all of the different items which I mentioned in the video, there'll be affiliate links to Amazon. So um, please follow those links if you're interested in, in, in any of these items. Um, but like I say, I bought these on eBay secondhand um, and they're perfectly good. Um, I'll be going into more videos later on, going into more detail about filters and whether or not, you know, w w which sort of filters are, I would say, essential and which ones are not so essential. Um, but yeah, filters are something that you will use a lot as a landscape photographer. So it's worth looking into and it's worth considering buying a set of filters. Um, there are various types you can get. You can either get filters which screw directly onto the front of the lens. So for instance, this one here, which is a UV filter, which I tend to keep on the end of my lenses just to protect the glass. That just screws straight on. Or you can also use a system like uh, the Koken system where you have a filter holder which screws on and this enables you to put multiple filters onto the end of your cameras. You can just slot the filters in. Um, you can put say a polarizer on and an ND grad um, and sort of use multiple filters together in that way. Um, those are the two options to go for. I would recommend personally, you know, maybe opting for um, uh, a filter holder system, certainly worth considering. Um, when it comes to filter types, uh, polarizing filters, I would say, are pretty much essential for landscape photography. They're brilliant for um, water. So, for instance, uh, the Koken polarizing filter is, looks like this. It just slots into the front, um, slots in here. And there's a circular circular polarizer. So the other thing to consider when using a DSLR is uh, you can sometimes find linear polarizers and circular polarizers. Linear polarizers are cheaper, but they often cause problems with your DSLR sensor in terms of no, not physical problems to it, but they can often cause problems, for instance, with autofocus. Um, so it's worth going for a circular polarizer rather than a linear polarizer. They are a little more expensive. Um, this Koken one, I, I can't remember how much it costs, but I'll put, put the link below. Um, certainly the Lee ones are over £100. Um, they are expensive, but I would say, you know, get a, get a polarising filter. For water, they take the surface glare off lakes, off rivers, any body of water in your photo. They, they really help to just take off that surface glare and are fantastic for you know, getting still um, water. You might want, not want to use them if you want, say, a, a reflection of a mountain in a lake. You might not want to use a polarizer in that instance, but certainly if you want to just take that surface glare off of water, use a polarizer. And skies as well, they really bring out the defi definition in the clouds. Um, and also, uh, if you're taking photos in the middle of a day and it's a bright daylight and it's a, a bright blue sky, often what we'll opt for is a black and white photo. And polarizing filters will actually turn that blue sky almost black when you turn it into a black and white photo. Um, there's a photo that we took in our video in uh, where we went to the, the Alps, and I took a photo of Mont Blanc, 
um, and it was a bright blue sky. And when we used the, the polarizing filter on, on, on that scene, it just turned that sky a really dark shade of black and it, it looked fantastic. So polarizing filters, probably the, if you're only gonna have one filter, get a polarizing filter. The other type of filters which I use quite a lot are solid ND filters. And these are really good for sort of blowing out water movement. Um, they basically act as like sunglasses in front of your lens. Um, they'll increase your exposure time, which means that you can do long exposure shots. And that's really good for sort of blowing out the surface of lakes, uh, blowing out waves in the sea. Um, you can use them for, uh, you know, producing really ethereal effects, especially if you use some of the, you know, 10 stop filters, really dark filters, which will give you really long exposures of sort of five, 10 minutes can be really good for getting some beautiful effects in, 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 in water and clouds. Um, so ND filters I use quite a lot. I'll be doing a video later on in the series where I cover the filters in more detail and I'll show you how I use, you know, 10 stop filters and ND filters um, and ND grads as well. Um, we'll be covering all of that in later videos. So once you've got your camera, you've got your filters, you've got your lens, you've got your tripod. Next most important thing, in fact, probably one of the most important things to get hold of is some way of cleaning your lenses. Your lenses are going to get dust on them. So get a blower. They're really cheap. This one was off Amazon. I can't remember how much it cost. It only cost a few pounds. Again, I provide the link below. Um, yeah, use a blower that blows the dust off what am I doing? <laughs> Use a blower to blow the dust off the end of your lens. Uh, then you can just give it a squirt with some lens cleaning fluid. Get some lens cleaning fluid. And absolutely every photographer should have hundreds of lens cloths. Buy them in the bulk. Get a bit of your bag and just stuff it full of lens cloths. You'll never have too many of these. You need them all the time, especially if you're out camping, if you're out in the hills you're outdoors, you're getting wet, it's raining, lens cloths. Keep spares, keep spares for your spares, just lens cloths, lots of them. Great things, never have enough. Now, as I mentioned, keep them in your bag. So the next thing to talk about is bags. Now, bags come in various types. You can buy hold all bags or backpacks. Um, I have one of these it's just a small little low pro shoulder bag um which i got when i first started out this is great when you don't have too many lenses you can keep the camera in here if it's lens attached you might be able to squeeze a spare lens in here too it's got pockets for all of your spare memory cards spare batteries all of that sort of stuff um really good and i like this one and i've hung on to it because it fits really nicely into the bottom of my camping rucksack so i can stuff the camera in here pop this in the bottom of my uh, main sort of backpack um, and then if I'm going hiking and camping um, it just keeps my camera gear nice and compact in one place I know where it is and it provides a good level of protection as well because it's got the padding really good quality bag something like that is great when you're first starting out eventually you might want something a little bit bigger um, and with landscape photography, a lot of the time we tend to be hiking long distance. So I tend to, to recommend, or I, I would recommend going for a backpack style bag rather than a hold all bag, uh, just because it would be more comfortable. Um, something like this uh, bag here, this is the Bumblebee 220 from Manfrotto. Um, and this bag is, is really great for hiking. I can strap a tripod to the side of it. I can get a flask and a map in the other side of it. It's got these sort of waist hips, which means that all the weight of all the gear is transferred to my waist. It's really comfortable for wearing on big long hikes when I'm carrying lots of heavy gear. And it's also large enough to take um, just basically tons of storage in here. Uh, I can fit the 5D in there with the um, 400mm lens attached. I can have uh, a spare 24 to 105 mil lens in there. Two filters go in there. I can stick vlogging gear down one side. I've got lens cleaning gear down the other side. Um, absolutely fantastic. Fits everything you could possibly want in it. Great bag. Something like that is ideal. Again, I'm not sponsored by uh, Manfrotto, so you know, <laughs> um, don't 
I'm not saying this because they're paying me to say it. They're great bags, fantastic. Um, so yeah, highly recommend that. The next thing that you might really want to consider getting is a shutter release. Um, this one here cost about three pounds, again off Amazon, doesn't matter. You know, these things, you, you can spend lots of money on getting like a, a, a really expensive shutter release that's an intervalometer and all of that kind of stuff. But unless you're doing kind of time-lapse photos, you don't really need it. A shutter release just has to be something simple. Um, I've dropped this in the sea. It's probably not going to last a huge amount of time. It was only three pounds, but it doesn't matter. You know, you can bung it in your bag, three pounds, and I use it so often. Um, if you're using like a 10 stop filter and you're doing long exposures of say longer than 30 seconds, you have to use a shutter release because um, I don't know about maybe more recent photos, but uh, the 5D Mark II certainly um, any longer than 30 seconds and you've got to put it into bulb. The bulb function, which basically means that the um, shutter will only be open, will, will be open for as long as you put, hold down the shutter release button. And then when you release the button, it will close. Now, if you did that whilst actually touching the camera, um, you'd end up with motion blur because when you touch the camera, it will move the camera and it will blur your photo. So we use a shutter release so that you can control it without having to touch the camera at all. Even when you're not doing that, use a shutter release or alternatively you can put your camera into a two second delay um, timer so that when it takes the photo, you're not actually touching the camera. Um, again, we'll run all through this again in later videos where I'll run through camera settings and all of that business. Um, we'll go into much more detail, but for now, shutter release, essential piece of equipment and at three pounds or four pounds or whatever I paid for this, yeah, just just get one, get two if you want to. Absolutely brilliant. Um, that's about it. Other things to get, you know, memory cards, spare batteries. Yes, you need to have these on you all the time. Make sure you've got a good stock of them. Um, and that really is about it. Once you've got some of these main bits of equipment and you, know, you don't need all of this equipment to get started. You can do landscape photography with your phone, but, <laughs> you know, it's nice to have control of the photos that you take. You can get perfectly great photos just by, you know, using cheaper cameras, compact cameras, phone cameras, whatever. You can get great photos. I'm not saying that you can't. Um, and you certainly don't need all of this equipment to get great landscape photos. You don't. Um, but this stuff makes it easier. And there are certain things like having a DSLR so that you can, you know, you can control your exposure time. That's how you'll sort of elevate yourself from just taking a snap of a landscape to getting some really impressive landscape photos. Um, it's sort of a starting point. Lenses, you know, get the best lenses you can afford. Um, I'd say the lens is more important than the camera. So, you know, if you can afford to get like a decent L series lens, but you can only afford a fairly basic DSLR, it's worth probably getting that because apart from anything else, you know, you will probably always have your L series lens. These things last years. Um, they are investments for the future. Whereas, you know, cheaper lenses, you might get more frustrated with them or you might get a bit fed up of the fact that they're not weatherproof. So you'll end up selling them on and replacing them anyway. So you know, it's, it's sometimes worth spending a little bit more if you can on something like an L series lens, um, just to get a little bit more longevity um, from it. Camera bodies as well, you know, a decent weatherproofed body. If you can, if you can stretch to it, it's worth it. But if you can't, don't worry about it. You know, you can do perfectly good landscape photography on entry level DSLRs, but it's worth going for the DSLR. Um, you know, go down to your local camera shop, test them out, find out which ones you like and just go for it. So I hope you found this video useful. Um, like I say, a lot of this stuff is very basic if you've been doing landscape photography for a while, but if you're new to it, I'm hoping that you've got some interesting information from it. Um, and in the next few videos, we'll be covering uh, subjects such as landscape composition, how to use filters, um, how to edit your photos after you've taken them. All of this stuff will be coming up as well. So please subscribe. Uh, please hit like as well if you like this video. Please leave your comments below and let me know what you think. Or if you're new to photography and you need any advice, um, let me know. 
Um, and yeah, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.